Today is our last sermon in our December series of More Than Just a Baby in a Manger. Um, this year is finished. If you still wanted to complete something this year, you have two days left. So maybe losing 20, kilometer, 20 kilograms in two days is not a good idea. But we're standing at the beginning of 2019. Just before 2018, you gov did research of the top New Year's resolutions that people had for 2018. Now, if you had to take a guess, what would be the top New Year's anniversary? These are not Christians, this is the world. So what would be the top money, make more money, lose weight, yes, lose weight, yeah? It's actually divided into the two things that cause you to lose weight, and that's eat healthier and get more exercise. Your medical advice for the day, there is no pill, there's no magical pill. It's eat healthier and get more exercise. That's how you do it. Okay, so, I mean... If you add that up, that's a tremendous amount of people for whom that was their vision for, for 2018. Sadly, they didn't go back to all of them now at the end of 2018 and ask them how it went. Other things, there was the other one, more money, save more money, make more money. They get a new job here at the bottom. Focus on self-care, for instance, more sleep, um, read more, make new friends, learn a new skill, get a new job and take up a new hobby. Those were the things that people wanted for their 2018. And it's interesting to see here at the bottom that 32% says, I don't plan on making any New Year's resolutions. And there could be very various reasons for that. Maybe you are like Kelvin when Hobbes told him that you, what, um, which New Year's resolutions did you make? He says, resolutions? Me? Just what are you implying that I need to change? Well, buddy, as far as I'm concerned, I'm perfect the way I am. So maybe you're like that. I don't need any New Year's resolutions. I am perfect just the way I am. But maybe for you, you've just given up hope that change will ever come. You've tried every year, and after a while, it's just like, just let go of that list. Just a little advert. Next Sunday, I'm going to preach on why New Year's resolutions normally don't stick. And how real change is possible only for Christians. Only believers can really do Holy, godly change. We have the power to do that. And we're going to talk about that n- next Sunday. But like I said, maybe for you, you don't call it New Year's resolutions, but you're just calling out to God for 2019. There are things in your life that you just say, God, please, not like 2018 again. And maybe it's better health. Maybe it's better finances. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's just you just want joy. You just had such a rough year. You just want a year of joy. Or maybe energy. You just want to wake up in the morning and feel like you are refreshed and ready for the day. Or maybe a better relationship with your spouse, your child, your parents, and your neighbors. But a more interesting question is, what do you think is God's desire for you for 2019? We've now spoken about people's desires for themselves. But what do you think is God's desire for you for 2019? In other words, the thing that God says, if you follow me in 2019 like you should, I want to gift you with this. What would be God's desire? It can't be complete full health. Because Paul prayed for it and God says, no, I'm not going to give it to you. It can't be no troubles. Because the Bible says in this world you will have trouble. But there are many things that God says, if you follow me, I will give you this. If you follow me, I will give you joy. If you follow me, I will give you rest. If you follow me, I will give you hope. And if you follow me, I will give you a future. And the one other thing, and that's the, the, the thing we want to spend time on today, and that's God says, if you follow me, I will give you peace. Peace. So let's open our Bibles to Isaiah 9 from verse 6 to 7 as we read for the last time this passage on who Jesus is. Isaiah 9 from verse 6 to 7. Before we read together, let's just pray. Yes, Lord, thank you for a song that Martin Luther wrote in 1529 and where he said, from age to age this truth will stand. And here we are standing in the year 2018, almost 2019, And that truth is not only standing, it's growing, Lord. Your truth is spreading. Your gospel is reaching people who have never been reached before. Thank you that you are trustworthy. That when you make promises, you keep your promises. And Lord, as we walk into 2019, 
Help us not to take any of those other paths that Brian spoke about, but that we will follow you, that we will walk with you, walk with the Spirit in us. We praise you that you are willing to hold out your hand so that we can walk with you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read together. Isaiah 9 from verse 6 to 7 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. So far we've looked at these titles given to Jesus. Titles who described who he is, his character, what he came to do. And the first one is that he was a wonderful counselor. Now the question is in 2019, where will you run for your guidance? 2019 you might start it fresh and bright and then that wall comes. Or that trouble, that trouble comes. Where will you run for advice? And a couple of weeks back I mentioned the, the line from the Casting Crown song that says, Stop asking Oprah what to do. The world does not have the answers. If they did, we wouldn't sit in a world where slavery is a bigger problem now than it's ever been. Where poverty is a bigger problem now than it's ever been. Where hatred and violence is as fierce as it's been through all through history. The world does not have the solutions. Stop running to Oprah and self-help books and self-appointed gurus. God is the counselor. God says, follow me and you will live well. Follow me and I will give you love and light. Um, That's the first one, a wonderful counselor. And the next one is, he's a mighty God. So the question is in 2019, where will you go for the power that you will need for this year? We look around us at the government and and family relationships and, and it just seems like everything seems to be falling apart. But God is a mighty fortress. Where will you run to find the God who can carry you through this year? And then the last, the third name we looked at was Everlasting Father. Where will you go in 2019 for love, for comfort, for companionship? Will you again run to those relationships that just harms it promises so much but it just destroys and harms or will you run to god now today we look at the last one on this list of names and it's prince of peace what a glorious concept peace is it's desire of beauty contest entrance for since time began world peace we just want world peace but one thing we have to realize is that when jesus speaks about peace it's not the same as when the world speaks about peace For the world, peace is no fighting. For the world, peace is everyone getting along. For the world, peace is everyone being allowed to do whatever they want to without interfering someone else who wants to do whatever they want to. That is the world. If if that can happen, the world will be happy. If everyone can just be on their own little place doing what they want without bothering anyone else, then we will have peace. And you know what? If God didn't exist and eternity didn't exist, and heaven and hell didn't exist, that's what we, that should be the thing that we should be striving for. If there was no God and no eternity, and this life is all there is, then obviously that is the, the peace we need to strive for, for everyone to get along. But the world's definition of peace ignores most of the picture. It focuses only on the physical realm, not the spiritual realm. We have a verse here in John 14, 27 that says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. When Jesus speaks about peace, it's a far bigger understanding about peace than the world has. Because he primarily speaks about peace with God. And it can be illustrated like this. Peace has an element where there's peace with God and then there's peace with man. And the world only looks at that part. And they say if we have that, we will have peace. And peace with man is not excluded. We don't say as Christians, well, the world does that one and we do this one and that's how we never meet. There are many passages in the Bible that says we must work at peace with one another. And there's a verse that says, uh, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live in peace with other people. 
Don't be the reason for a lack of peace. I remember when I worked in Durbanville with the young adults, there was one girl, and you, none of you would know her, so it's fine. Wherever she went, the groups would always fight. And then she'd say, yuck, it's that person's fault. And then she moves to her next friend group, and then they would be fighting. They're like, oh, no, no, it's that one or that. And, then she, and I said, do you see the common denominator in all these things? It's you. And sadly, as Christians, we are often not the peacemakers, but the war makers in the relationships with other people. The verse says, as far as possible, because it won't always be possible. There's another passage in the Bible that says, if you come to church, I mean, if you come to the temple in that context, but if you come there and you want to bring your offering, so you want to come and worship God, that's the motive of your heart, and you suddenly realize, wait, there's a brother of mine, another Christian believer, who has an issue with me, he says, leave your offering and go make right with that God. And now that doesn't sit well with us. I mean, isn't worship of God more important than fixing relationships? God says, if you don't even see the importance of fixing relationships, are you truly worshiping me anyway? But this peace is not always achievable, especially with those who are enemies of God. And the Bible says, you will be hated for my name's sake. Someone shared with me at our Christmas meal, uh, she went to someone's house in Stillby, and she just mentioned the name of God, and she was chased out of the house. She just spoke about what God did for her, and she was chased out. That name will not be mentioned in my house. We will be hated for the sake of God. And Jesus made it very clear that that is not the thing I came primarily for. I didn't primarily came for peace with man. He says in Matthew ten thirty four, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. That horizontal peace. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against a mother. And a daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. And that's a terrible verse. If you're sitting in the midst of conflict in your family. Say, God, but that's, that's what I want. That's my desire. That's the top of my list for 2019. Is that I want peace with all the people in my household. And Jesus said, I came to bring the sword. He didn't come to cause fights. But he says, the truth that I'm bringing will split the people in two crowds. My gospel, my good news will have those who say, yes, God, we want you. And those who say, no, we don't, you want you. And that will cause division. And because the vertical peace is more important, peace with God is far more important. Sometimes we will have war with others. Because they are at war with God. But peace with God, that is a possibility. This peace with man is not always a possibility in this world. But peace with God is always a possibility. And it's not just the state of peace. The, we're going to talk about that a bit later. That we are in a state of peace with God. There's no longer war between us and God. But also the experience of peace. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. There's a peace that God gives that removes troubled hearts. And once again, I don't know what you are facing in 2019. There are one or two things about 2019 when I start thinking about it, I, st I prefer to stop thinking about it. Because I know there are some things waiting for me that's going to be tough to deal with. But God says, I come to bring a peace that is an experience. Because it takes away your troubled heart. And it takes away your fear. What do you fear of 2019? Do you fear what's happening in government? What's happening in the financial system? What's happening in your town? What's happening in your family? What's happening with your finances and your health? God says, there's an experience of peace that I want to give you that takes away fear. And see, the word used in Isaiah 9, 6 for peace is a word we know very well. And that's the word shalom. Shalom. One of the most important Hebrew words. And it's very difficult to translate it into any other language because it means so many things. It means completedness. It means soundness, it means welfare, it means peace, it means safety, it means prosperity. I love this picture. Shalom is a Hebrew word for complete peace, contentment, completeness, wholeness, 
well-being and harmony. That is a type of relationship that God wants with you in 2019. Shalom. Not because things are going well horizontally, but often in spite of things going badly horizontally, but because things are going well vertically. Shalom is that picture of Moses in the basket. Here's Moses. The king wants to kill him. Pharaoh wants to kill him. Pharaoh is sending out his soldiers. He's being put in a river. And I don't, as I know of many old people, when they get into the river, they float one way and then they get out again. But, but Moses is put in the river in a basket, closed. It's dark. But he has shalom because he's protected there. Shalom is the picture of the Israelites traveling through the wilderness. And it's tough and it's rough. And you have to walk and the sun is baking down. But they have shalom because the cloud of God covers them in the day to give them shade. And then the night when it's freezing, they have shalom because the fire column of God is there to protect them. And I think the best picture of shalom is when Jesus and his disciples went on the boat. And the storm is raging. And Jesus is sleeping. He has shalom. He knows it's crazy and the world is crazy and the storms are crazy. But I'm in the hands of God and I'm protected. That's the relationship that God wants with you in 2019. Peace in spite of the world. Completedness, wholeness. And why is Jesus the Prince of Peace? I like the Hebrew for that. It's the Sar Shalom. The, the, I think that's the way we get the other words Tsar from. Because it seems that in the biblical time, the prince was often the commander of the army. If you think of King Saul and his son Jonathan, it was one of the commanders of his army. So why is Jesus the Prince of Peace? Because he is the one achieving and bringing peace. He is the one who came to achieve peace between us and God. Now why do we need peace with God? Because that's the gospel. Our sinfulness and our, our evil brought it made us enemies with God. And Romans 5.10 says, For we, while we were enemies, were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by His life. Every person is an enemy of God. That's the bad news of the good news. That we are born enemies of God. And the result of the enemies is that we will be defeated by God one day. And we will be punished by God one day. And it will be right. But then Jesus came. And the great exchange happened that I spoke about on Christmas Day. Jesus came and says, you earned punishment. I lived my life perfectly and I earned righteousness. Now give me that punishment you deserved and I will take it. And here's the righteousness that I deserved. You take it and you can be right with God again. And he was punished instead of us. That's the great exchange. And like Romans 5 verse 10 says, it's by the death of His Son. His death on the cross reconciled us with God, which is just another way of saying we have peace with God now. The good news is then that all who believe in Jesus, all who turn their back on their old life, are saved. Saved from what? Saved from judgment. Saved from eternal hell. Saved from everything we deserve. But we are also saved too. What are we saved to? We are saved to shalom. We are saved to peace with God. We are saved in standing. We are no longer guilty. I can walk into God's presence as a child of the King. And I'm allowed to stand there because I'm righteous through the blood of Jesus. We are saved in future. We are saved to a perfect future. One day when He comes back and He fixes His world and everything is right. I am saved to that. To live with Him forever. But I'm also saved in relationship, that I can be his child and his friend. For the month of December, we meditated on Jesus. The center point of Christianity is not the church. I often say that as Westerners, we are very good at making churchians. We are very good at making churchians. We are very good to plug people into a church and make them attend church and a Bible study and to give them a ministry and they do something and they feel good about what they're doing. But they are churchians. In other words, they don't walk with God when they're alone. 
They don't spend time with God when they're alone. They just have a communal relationship with God. Church is not the center of Christianity, even though church is great and important. Rules is not this, the center of Christianity. I'm a Christian, therefore I must do this and this and this and this. No, rules are fantastic because they're for our goodwill. But rules is not the center of Christianity. Eternal life is not the center of Christianity. Until, but that is absolutely awesome. And that's our hope and the thing we're looking forward to. The greatest thing about Christianity is reconciliation with God. That I can have a relationship with God again. That I can walk with Him and that I can know Him. We read in Philippians 3, 7. This is Paul giving, giving his pedigree about all the fantastic things in his life. And he says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says, the greatest worth for me is knowing Jesus as Christ and Lord. So can I ask you today, do you know Him? Do you have shalom with God? How would you describe your relationship with God? Is it a business transaction? Well, Jesus did this and this and this. And then I did that and that and that. And now God owes me eternity and I will wait for it. Is your relationship with God religion? Well, I choose this group and I guess they have some rules I have to follow to keep everyone happy. And now I'm part of it. Is your relationship with God something you're still trying to figure out? Or do you know Him? Do you know Him? Do you love spending time with Him? Do you have that shalom? When people are standing around the braai and they talk about the future, does your anxiety rise with theirs? Or are you seated in the shalom of a God who is in control? When you read the newspaper, when they, this time of the year they're going to play on TV all those top 10 things that happened this year, and I think very few of them will be good things. When you look at it, do you look at it with hope because you have shalom? Or do you look at it with fear because what will 2019 bring of 2018 was so bad? Do you know him like a best friend, like a comforter, like a helper, like a Lord, like a savior? Now the question is, how do I get to know him better? Because that sounds good. That shalom thing sounds fantastic. Well, firstly, you have to be saved. That's if, you have, if you're an enemy of God, you can't have shalom. You have to repent. You have to turn your back on your old life. You have to stop living for self. Whether you live for self will be very clear from your New Year's resolutions. If it's all about you, you're living for self. Are you living for God? So I have to repent. I have to turn my back on my old life. I have to believe in Him. I have to accept Him as Lord and Savior. I have to follow Him. That's the start. But how do I get to know Him now? Just like you get to know any other friend. If I want to know you, I need to know about you. Isn't it when you start a romantic relationship, you can't stop thinking about that person and finding out new things about her. And the greatest moment is when you find out what her favorite color is and what her favorite flower is because now you can buy that flower for her and make her happy. You just want to know more and more about that person because you know in knowing about that person, I will know that person. But that's not the only thing because you can know about someone and not know them. The next thing is to spend time in that person's company. Just to sit at them where there's, sometimes there are no words. Where there's no need to talk. And the next thing is to communicate with that person. To speak and to listen. Those are the three things to get to know a person better. Maybe with your wife or your husband. And your relationship is wobbly. Implement those three things this year. Get to know more about her. Maybe by now you think, I know all of it. Nope, you're never going to know everything about a woman, trust me. <laughs> Learn about her, ask her new questions. What excites you about this year? What excites you about life? What troubled you about last year? What things in me do you dislike? That's a fantastic question to ask. Be ready for the list, the written list to come out. Get to know that person. And then spend time in the presence of your wife or your husband. Stop having separate activities all the time. And communicate. What is emptiness syndrome? It's that when the children leave, you suddenly realize we never spoke to each other. We never shared anything. We had a common denominator of the children and now they're gone. Don't let that happen to you. But that's just the example. The same thing counts for God. Get to know about God. 
Read your Bible. Learn that he is a counselor. Maybe you've never thought that God wants to give me advice for life. I run to Oprah. Oprah is useless. I can run to God. Get to know God and then spend time in his company. Have a time in your diary that's just me and God. And speak to him. Communicate with him. You know what? On a Sunday, we do mainly number one and a little bit of two and three. We, may, we are mainly here to learn about God. And yes, we also spend time in His company with others. And we also communicate with Him through prayer and singing. But number two and three happens best when you're alone with God every day. Being in His presence. Sitting at His feet. Speaking to Him. Listening to hear from Him. That's what it means to know Him. So I want to encourage you for 2019. If you are still an enemy of God, make peace before it's too late. I was just telling Bruce, every beginning of the year, I always wonder who will still be with us at the end of the year. And so often it's people I never expected who pass us away in that year. Margaret was fine two months ago. She was healthy and fine two months ago. And she passed away this morning. Make peace with God. And in this year, live to get to know God. We're going to watch a little video clip now that asks the question, do you know him? The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him for you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! The quality of your 2019 depends whether you have shalom with God. 
The quality of your 2019 depends whether you know Jesus. And the quality of your eternity depends whether you know God. Let's pray together. Yes, Lord, how wonderful to know that this word tells so much about you. And yet it's just a drop in the ocean. That for eternity long we will learn more about you. And be enthralled more about you. And be amazed more about you and your glory. And Lord, thank you that that journey can start here. That we can know you. That David can say, in your presence there is fullness of joy. Lord, I pray for all of us, Lord, that we will live 2019 in your presence and experience that fullness of joy, experience that peace, experience that hope, experience that removal of troubled hearts, and experience that removal of fear, that we can know you. Oh Lord, be gracious to us. and Come down and hold us. We praise you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.